why do we give? We give because it reminds us that all we have belongs to God in the first place. We give because it moves the mission of God forward and upward in this world. We give because an investment in the kingdom of God will never return void. We give because it breaks the temptation toward greed and materialism. We give because radical generosity leads to radical change in our lives, our churches, our communities, and in our world. We give because giving is a gift, not just for those who receive something, but giving is a gift for those who give. For Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So what would it look like for you this year to be generous? To not just ask, what can I spare? But instead to ask, what will it take? When God's blessing comes to us, it must also go through us. Because generosity isn't just something God wants from us. Generosity is something God wants for us. That is the gift of giving. Welcome to The Bridge. We're glad you joined us. We offer many other Bible study, prayer, and fellowship opportunities throughout the week. We would love to have you attend one or several. On Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. is our adult Sunday school Bible study at the church. Currently, Joe Dankel is working through 1st and 2nd Corinthians. On Wednesdays at 12 p.m. is our prayer service and Bible study at the church. Currently, Pastor Aaron is hosting this service. Pastor Aaron hosts Refuge Radio every Saturday morning at 9.10 a.m. on WMBS. Currently, he is teaching through the book of James. And on the last Sunday morning of every month, Pastor Aaron hosts Ask the Pastor at 9.15 a.m. before Sunday service. This is a great opportunity to bring your most difficult Bible questions for discussion. Now, let's join Pastor Aaron for his new sermon series in Jude. Amen, church. Well, we're going to go to Jude here in a second, but before we do, I know many of you have heard there's wonderful news uh, from my dad and from Kim and, and with the good news of what God has done uh, in your guys' lives, and we're just here to celebrate. I'm holding back. I was going to give praise, but I want you guys to tell the church this morning what God has done, and they're going to share a testimony with us before we get into the Word this morning. So they're going to come and use this mic here, and then for our friends who are watching live, you'll also be able to to hear their testimony this morning. God is faithful. Good morning. It's uh, great to be here. God is good. He is amazing. God bless every one of you. Um, we wanted to share part of our journey uh, of this trip of cancer and pain that we've been through and with you because you have all been such a, an amazing part of that with prayer and cards and calls and uh, just support all around. You've all been amazing. I uh, thank you, and we love you all. And uh, I pray for each one of you each and every day. And uh, anyway, uh, the when we started on this journey, I saw many mountains and many obstacles getting in our way, and it was just one thing after the other, and it was just very confusing and very frustrating, but. Through God, 
He just showed me the way. Uh, he reminded me, don't worry about those mountains, Rod. <laughs> he said, he said, <laughs> Remember all those good times in the mountains. We hiked, and I showed you the wonders of nature, and uh, you explored, found the beauty of certain things, and just laying beside a stream and just enjoying God's amazing world. And uh, that's how he made me look at these mountains and made me realize that only through these mountains and these troubles could I come closer to him and uh, <clears throat> he made me realize he would make mountains into molehills. All I got to do is put all my faith in him, all my trust in him. And... Uh, that's why I continue to pray for each and every one of you. I pray for everyone in my cancer clinic that I deal with, that I, that I sit with every other week and go through treatments. And uh, there's so many people a lot worse off than me. And uh, <coughs> Lord bless them all. And uh, at this time, uh, Kim has some things she wants to <laughs> share with you. <coughs> Well, one more thing I'd like to say. <laughs> it's in the family. It runs in the family. Uh, it, uh, uh, my doctor, my surgeon, he's a pretty good guy. He really is. He, uh, he came in. I can tell just by his demeanor when he walks in the room. Even though I can't see him, I can, I can just tell by his walk. You know, if it's somber it's not really good news if it's, you know, giddy or whatever. But today, this day, he came in. He was practically skipping. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was just so joyful. And he said, Rod, he grabbed my hand. He said, he said, it's gone, buddy. He said, it's gone. Okay, you guys can hear me. Okay, I'm going to hold you. Okay, the year 2020, March of that year, the pandemic affected all of us. Life as we knew it was rearranged in so many ways. It also was the year our eyes became wide open to focus on Jesus. Because July of that year is when Rod was diagnosed with cancer. And also a month and a half later, he lost his sight due to, to de detached retinas. And even though through all the darkness of that year, God's light was shining brighter than ever for us. Okay. Before the year 2020, my walk with Jesus was laxing and weak. For me, I was too busy or didn't see the importance of reading the Bible daily and learning of God's word nor to find time to go to church. I felt I could do church on my own. At times, Rod and I were living out our journey unprepared. We lived our lives around our plan. In our journey's backpack, we thought we had everything we needed to get through each day, we thought. But there was one thing missing that we didn't pack, the Bible. There was no room for it in our backpack. As we looked as we looked at and studied our own map of life and where it was leading us, we would decide on which road suited us best at that time and it would fit our needs. So we traveled out using our map as a guide year after year, making sure that no obstacles were in sight along the journey. The terrain we traveled was flat. Then one day while on the journey, we looked up and a huge mountain appeared. It caught both of us by surprise, since the mountain was nowhere on our, our map. We were at a standstill, frozen at the foot of this unpredictable mountain. We knew in order to survive spiritually, we needed to start climbing the best we could. 
Our backpacks that we were carrying were so heavy and loaded down with items we thought we needed to survive, but decided to leave it all at the base of the mountain. The only item that would keep us safe, focused, and give us strength to climb and survive was the Bible, God's Word. The one item we forgot to pack, but it miraculously appeared in our hands. God's Word spoke to both our souls daily and still does. Faith, hope, trust, obedience, patience, and Psalm 23. We started focusing more and more on Jesus and not the storm. While climbing the highest peaks, we shed many tears, but we also were blessed with countless blessings. We gave all the glory to God. We held on to each other close, leaned on our loving family and friends for support and countless prayers. In doctors' waiting rooms, we were able to share with complete strangers, the peace of God while going through the storms. Some even helped me while waiting. When God planted the Bridge Baptist Church 12 years ago, he knew that Rod and I would find our way back to church. The fellowship, prayers, and love from our church family are true blessing from God. The year 2020 was indeed life-changing, for the better. Rod and I have perfect vision to focus on Christ and not the storm. We will continue to journey through our life here on earth, relying on God's map, his plan for us, and not our own. We will continue to serve God and pray for his guidance in how to serve more in his glory. We are more aware of the people he places in our lives as opportunities to share his word and to seek out any lost souls that they too can be saved. It truly is a miracle that we are standing here in front of you in church, sharing our journey, and no one but God could be doing this. And what I, what I like to do now, though, is part of well, how this mountain came. And, um, when Rod gets blood, when he gets blood work, and they check his the cancer markers. Um, we get a, a, a graph, and and it wasn't until going through it from October the 6th, 2020, of chemo through December of la this past year, 22, the graph looked like this. And what we saw, and the doctor saw too, he explained it, he said, the markings, when they go up, that means the cancer is active. But when they go down, that's good. The, the chemo is working. But it also looks like mountains. So I went, oh my goodness, the mountains that God is giving us. Fortunate, fortunately, this is where we're at here today. We're at the bottom. <laughs> but you know what's funny about this paper? Through this, this area, the white area, to the naked eye, you really don't see anything. But this... This is, this is what God, what we see, all the words, all the, the trust in God, in Jesus. This is what our mountain is made of now. It's solid rock. I hope everybody can see that. And also our mountain, because of all, everything, it's the blessings as well. It's the church family. Still, we have God, and God provides, and the miracle that he can provide for anyone going through your, your, your trials. We promise God always to walk with him. He is our focus now. He's in our backpack now. Thank you. We could uh, we could pack up and go home after that, guys. Uh, I don't even need to preach. Um, 
Man, uh, my cup is full and overflowing from your testimony, guys. Uh, we're so thrilled. I mean, what a powerful, powerful testimony and a great example. When you look at those mountains, those scriptures and friends and family and church and uh, tearing me up uh, this morning. So in a good way, I love you guys so much. And I'm so proud of how you guys are following Jesus. We're thankful for that. Amen. Uh, but I'm going to preach anyways. Uh, <laughs> yep, you're, you're not, you're not going to escape. Uh, uh, yep. So let's stand together, guys, and we'll, uh, we'll get into it this morning. God is good. Amen. Uh, we stand out of a reverence for the authority of Scripture as we read. And uh, last week, we covered the first four verses. Of the, te- of the little letter of Jude. We're going to pick it up this week in verse 5. Jude continues, and he writes and says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this text. Lord, thank you for the testimonies we've heard this morning, Lord. Thank you for the good news of your healing hand and deliverance, God. Lord, thank you that you are with us in the mountain and in the valley of life. Thank you that you are our good shepherd, Lord, who walks with us, Lord, even in the valley of the shadow of death, and we will fear no evil. We thank you that you are with us, Lord. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. Lord, thank you that you prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Thank you that we will dwell with you, Lord, in your house forevermore. Lord, we thank you now that this is your word. Lord, you know where our wrestling hearts and minds may be this morning. I pray that you would help us now to fixate those hearts and lives, Lord, upon what you have to say to us. Holy Spirit, may you uh, speak to us and meet with us by drilling your word deep into our hearts and into our minds. Give us understanding. Give us ears that hear and eyes that see and hearts and minds that understand. Lord Jesus, may you be seen, heard, and known, and made much of and exalted. Father, may you be most glorified. And it is in your precious name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So we continue this morning through the little letter of Jude. And we established last week that the author of this letter is, of course, the brother of James, as Jude tells us. In the, uh, in the very first verse here, as he begins to describe himself, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. He's the brother of James, we know that, uh, which makes him also the half-brother, like G- James, to Jesus. And half-brother, I say half-brother because Jesus is the Son of God, amen? Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, and thus Joseph really is Jesus' adoptive father. You can note Mark 6, 3, and you will find that uh, Mary and Joseph, they had several children, as we noted last week. They had four boys and at least two girls. Both James and Jude, they're listed among those lists of boys that they had. Uh, Our Lord's brothers, we know, or his brothers in the flesh, they did not believe in him while he was ministering on the earth during his life and ministry. We noted that last week from John 7, 5. But it was after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it was after the resurrection of Christ, that Christ did indeed rise from the grave, that James is converted. We know this from 1 Corinthians 15, 7, that Jesus specifically had some kind of meeting with his little brother James and came to James. And James becomes a believer and a follower now of Christ as Lord. And Jude was also converted, we have every reason to believe, at that time. We know from Acts 1.14, it tells us that his brothers were part of that praying group that was in Jerusalem in that upper room meeting where they were praying in that upper room. They were waiting on the Holy Spirit to come in obedience to what Jesus had told them to do. 
We also know 1 Corinthians 9, 5 tells us that the brothers of the Lord, they were known in the early church. They were engaged in active ministry with the early church. Uh, and we, so, we, so we know that, that they were not only followers of Jesus, but they were actively engaged in faithful ministry and missions work with the church as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Now, I have to note of just a few things from last week before we jump into verse 5, just because I didn't finish last week. Probably will not finish this week. That's okay, though. Uh, but this, this, this faith, what we were talking about last week, that'll bring us into verse 5 here. This faith, remember, it was a stationary, already delivered to the saints' faith, wasn't it? It still is that way, amen? We don't add to the faith. We don't subtract from the faith. There's no additions to this faith. It's a gospel that's already been given unto us. If anyone comes to you with a different gospel, they, uh, Paul says, let them be accursed. There is no other gospel than the gospel that's already been given to us. And it's a once for all delivered to the saints faith. That was verse 3. And what Jude uh, feels impressed upon his heart to do now is, is to tell us and encourage us to contend for this faith. What that basically means is stand firm in this gospel that's been given to you. Then understand that it has already been delivered to you. It's already been given to you. There's no additions, no subtractions from it. You need to be faithful to preach this gospel. You need to be faithful to contend uh, the good fight of faith standing in this gospel. And he told us why, remember in verse 4, he says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed. There's creepers. Remember we talked about this last week. Creepers, they've infiltrated the church. And that's literally what the word crep means. It literally means to infiltrate. They've infiltrated the church. It literally means to slip into a, uh, a, a pool without creating a ripple. That's how sneaky they are. And they, they have infiltrated the church in such a way as this. And the reason for needing to contend for the faith, it's found there in verse 4, that these People, they've crept in unnoticed. But even though they're unnoticed by many who are the church, God notices them. And that's what Jude wants us to realize, that none of them slip past the head of the church, which is Christ. Christ sees them. And, and this again, this creeping in unnoticed, it carries the idea of like a snake, I said last week, slipping into the garden wherein farmers are at work. Or, or work. Uh, kind of like how the snake was in the Garden of Eden, which is the father of these apostates. Their, their father is the devil. Their father is not our heavenly father. These apostates were never true disciples of Jesus. They are Judas Iscariots among us. And they've crept in unnoticed. Much like Jesus talked about the fact that there are wolves that creep into the fold. They make their way into the fold to tear apart the sheep. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. If you ever wonder why we put such an emphasis on doctrine in this church, first and foremost, because it is God's word. And we cherish God's word. We treasure God's word uh, above all else in this church. And I, I want you to know that I treasure the authority of scripture above all else, anything else as your pastor. That's what I treasure most, the authority of God's word. So we have a high regard for scripture. But also we understand that when we stand on the truth of scripture, it's going to keep the wolves out as much as possible. And when they infiltrate the church, they're going to eventually be exposed for what they are. Because the truth will drive out lies. The truth will drive out falsehood. The truth will drive out any Judas Iscariots among us. They won't be able to, to hide out there very long. There are those who long ago, Jude told us, they were designated for this condemnation, he said. Designated for this condemnation. It was already decided from long ago that God was going to judge them and God knew exactly how he was going to judge them and God knew why they were even permitted to be there and what he was going to do with them. No one escapes the all-seeing eye of Almighty God. I find great comfort in that. These people, they are, as we saw last week, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our Lord, of our, of our God into sensuality. Jude then says, 
uh, they also deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. They pervert the grace of God into sensuality. They deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So the bottom line is that God already knows who these people are. He has known all about them. Uh, They have been designated to a particular condemnation. And God sees the creepers. Though they may think they're they're sly and they're crafty and they infiltrated the church and they're going to get away with it. They're never going to get away with it. God sees them and God will appropriately deal with them. And that is why God's people must all the more stand their ground in the truth. Jude was not alone in this fight. We noted some of this last week. Truthfully, all throughout the New Testament, we see New Testament writers addressing the dangers of false teachers. The dangers of false teachers and the believer's call to stand up for the fight, to know their Bible. That is a calling for every single one of us to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to be studying the Word of God, to know the Word of God, to stand on solid ground throughout our week, not just hearing the Word taught on Sunday. Again, we noted earlier that uh, 2 Peter and Jude, they're almost identical in uh, parts of Peter's second letter as they were uh, written around the same time between anywhere from 60 to 80 AD. The Apostle Paul had the same concerns for the church of Corinth. He said this to the church of Corinth. He said, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul had that concern for the church. That they could actually be led astray. That, that there is a, there's a serpent here, just as there was with Eve. And he's, he's cunning and he's, he's concerned that God's people could be led astray from the truth. Just as Eve was. Paul said, for if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. You let that happen, it's because you're putting up with it. Don't put up with it is what Paul's telling you. Don't put up with error. Don't put up with that. Have your spiritual radar up and understand and know how to discern truth. But he said if you put up with it, you're going to say essentially telling them they're going to suffer the consequences for that. Paul was concerned that the church was giving sway to false teachers. Many of these people spoke boldly. They would speak passionately, maybe with great zeal. They were getting a following. And Paul evidently was warning the church, don't put up with it. Uh, Calling out those who were putting up with it and calling out those who were false teachers saying, we know you're here. Amen? God knows you're here and God's going to deal with you. See, I, I've never really made it my, my uh, uh, any kind of a ministry out of it where I have to go on constant witch hunts because I know this, God sees the witches. My, my responsibility above all is to just be faithful to the truth. I will pro- passionately, bo- boldly proclaim the truth and I know that God sees the witches and the ditches and He's going to take going to draw them out and say, I see you, I know you're here and I'm going to deal with you and the truth will drive out the falsehood. And the errors and the liars. So Paul gives similar warning. Uh, he gives similar warning to, to the church as does Jude to beware of these people. He gives similar warning not to let anyone pervert the gospel of Christ with any new and different or special so-called revelations from God. There's a lot of that going around today. Various teachings that are outside of God's inspired word. Paul said to the Galatians, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel, even an angel, he says, from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, he says, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. He says it twice. 
Amen? It doesn't matter what their revelation is. It doesn't matter what they say they saw. It doesn't matter what they say they experienced. As you've heard me say it countless times, we judge every experience by the truth of Scripture, regardless of what you said you experienced with God. I'm going to judge your experience by the truth and the authority of the Word of God. It trumps your experience. It trumps your revelation you say you had. You say, one thing we will not have here is people standing up. God gave me a word. God gave me a revelation. If your word is not the word, sit down. Amen? Because this is the authority. We already have the word from God. And this is it, brothers and sisters. We're not going to put up with... False teaching going around in the church. We understand that they're there. We understand that they're going to creep in. We understand that they have a a, a motive, an agenda that is satanically driven and demonically influenced. And we're going to call it out when we see it. There will be times when we hear people say, God told me this, or God said this to me, or I had a dream, or God gave me a vision, or I have a new word from God for you. We ought to immediately have our uh, contending shield of faith up, ready to defend the truth when that happens. You see, the Quran is not the word of God, brothers and sisters. Amen? The Book of Mormon is not the word of God. Joseph Smith did not hear from God. Hinduism, Buddhism, Gnosticism is not the authority of the Word of God. The New World Translation that the Jehovah Witnesses want to peddle to you on your doorstep. It is not the Word of God. The Pope has no new revelation from God. He is not a representative of God's written authoritative Word. No preacher, no minister, no pastor, no church member, no evangelist, no witness has new revelation from God today. They are not personal representatives of the authority of the Word of God with new revelation for us. There's a period at the book of Revelation for a reason. The Bible and only the Bible, the Bible is our final authority. So everything, everyone, everything should be checked and cross-examined by the authority of God's written word that the Holy Spirit breathed out, 2 Timothy 3.16. The Bible says, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed to the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. We cannot give one ounce of sway to false teachers that want to portray Jesus in any other light than how He actually is, that He is the Creator. He is the Sovereign Lord. He is Almighty God. He is the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ is the Creator. He is our Savior. He did endure the just wrath of God. And that wrath was just to be poured out upon you, sinner. That's another thing we need to call out. Fluffy gospel presentations that aren't the gospel at all. Things like telling people, okay, you need to know Jesus loves you. Now say this little prayer and you're going to heaven. Where's the gospel in that? Why do I even need Jesus? And what is heaven? And what is hell? And what do you mean this little prayer? What is, what is this prayer? What does it even mean? Is there a little Jesus that comes into my heart and sets up shop? What are you talking about? We need to explain to people the gospel. We need, they need to feel, they feel the terror of the reality that you're going to hell apart from Jesus. That apart from this just wrath of God being poured out upon the one and only perfect man, which is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be no mediator for you. There would be no satisfactory payment that's been made for you apart from the one that was made for you at Mount Calvary where Jesus poured out His life for you. That's the gospel that He stood in your place and He absorbed that wrath for you at Mount Calvary. The nails were therefore put to his hands and his feet and his body was ripped apart and his blood was poured out and his blood was shed to make atonement once and for all for your sin. The Jesus Christ then was vindicated to truly be the Son of God evidenced in his resurrection that he conquered sin, Satan, death, and hell for you. He crushed the serpent's head, Genesis 3.15, Hebrews 2.14-15. That's the gospel. The people then realize, and we, we, let's not forget that very key word, repent. Oh, how often that's missing. You know, I, well, one, one, of the, one of the most popular books out there for Christians is that purpose-driven life that goes around a lot. But you know what you won't find in that purpose-driven life? Much talk at all about repentance. I don't even know if it's in the book. I haven't read the book. 
So I'll be fair in that. But I've read excerpts on it. And from what I understand, there's not a whole lot of talk of the reconciling work of Jesus or the, or the blood that was shed, the, God, the reality of heaven and hell and the repentance and all those necessary truths that must be presented to us in the gospel. People need to see that they're sick before they go to the physician. And they need to know why they need the physician. This is the gospel. I don't want to rabbit trail. You guys know what the gospel is. We preach it every Sunday. Amen? But the, the, the reality is, what we're getting to here is Jude knows there are apostates in the church. He knows that they're here. God knows that they're here. We don't need to be worried and freaking out and think, okay, where are they? Let's spot them. Let's find them. Let's, let's, let's do it. No, God's going to deal with them as we just stand on the truth. And as we just be faithful to the truth, it will drive out the enemy. So, Paul, so Jude wants to get to that. He wants us to contend. He wants us to stand our ground. In the faith. So we covered verses 1 through 4. We learned who Jude was, why Jude wrote this particular letter, who Jude wrote to, and who Jude warned us of. And in short summary, Jude's appeal to us again is to contend. By the way, that's a Greek compound verb. It means to agonize for the faith, that you're going to bleed a little, you're going to sweat a little bit. Guess what? You're going to work for the kingdom if you're going to actually stand up and fight for the cause of Christ in this world. So you're going to agonize a little bit. This means to vigorously battle to win. And Jude, Jude is also clear that this is a faith that was once again, for, he says, once for all delivered to the saints. It's a faith we've already been given. Now I'm, I'm going to move along quickly at this point because I, I want to get to our next verses. But let me point out that in verse this, this one verse... Uh, Jude provides Christians with three traits of apostasy. And this is in verse 4 when I say this one verse. I'm in Revelation for some reason. Let me go back to Jude. He says in verse 4, again, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God, into sensuality, and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. First, Jude says, apostasy, it can be subtle. And he wants us to know that it can be subtle. They creep in, they're creepers. A.W. Tozer once said this, so skilled is the error at, is error at imitating truth that the two are constantly being mistaken for each other. It takes a sharp eye these days to know which brother is Cain and which brother is Abel. He also notes, uh, we, Jude does, uh, secondly, uh, he describes that apostates are simply this. They are ungodly people. There's no way around it. You'll get to the bottom of it and you'll find out they are ungodly. They are not godly people. They might put on a front that they are Christians. They may put on a front that they love Jesus. They may put on a front that they're godly people. But at the bottom line, end of the day, what you'll eventually find out is they are ungodly, wicked, rebellious people. They do not care about Jesus. They do not care about you. They only care about their own personal motives and agendas and their own kingdom building for self. And then thirdly, Jude says, these apostates, they ultimately, again, they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, with that said, where we're at today, that's what I didn't get to finish last week. You're welcome. Now, note these examples. Old Testament examples now that Jude wants us to look back to. Why? Why does he give us these examples? Well, these examples are essentially their Old Testament examples now of apostates. This is apostasy. Was it going on? It was going back on not only in the church, in the time of the church, in the early church, but it was going on clear back in the Old Testament. It's nothing new. It's been going on since the fall of man. There has been apostasy. Those and this, this idea of apostasy, it means to appear to be one thing, but then to be proven to be another thing is you turn away, you rebel, you turn away from it. And it comes out of this word that's used here, that they have turned away. For certain people have crept in unnoticed too long ago were designated to this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our, of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 5, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people 
out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who do not believe those those who do not believe. So he says, okay, let's let's do some homework here. Let's go back to the Old Testament. And Jude is going to highlight specific Old Testament accounts that are well known among God's people. That's why he doesn't have to go into detail here. As soon as he mentions and references to those in the Old Testament, which is clearly Israel, by the way, the the what we see here is that there's basically Israel, that's verse 5. There's angels, that's verse 6. And there's Sodom and Gomorrah, that's verse 7. And I wrote down three words, destruction, judgment, and punishment. That's what we see in each one of those verses. With Israel, there's destruction. With angels, there's judgment. With Sodom and Gomorrah, there was clear punishment. And they all three are examples of those who appeared to be one thing, or at one time were seeming to appear to be with God, and then turn away, that's apostasy, from the truth and rebellion. And there's destruction, judgment, and punishment. All three of these are tied to rebellion and abandonment from the truth and sexual immorality and the pursuit of wicked and carnal, ungodly appetites, which is what apostates always are proven to go after. Jude warns these apostates, we know you're here. And notice these are also Jews, angels, and Gentiles. They're all across the bases, aren't they? From the heavenly realm, to the physical realm, to the Jews themselves, to the Gentiles, they're everywhere. There's uh, the Jews with Israel, the angels here with these uh, angels that are referenced to, these Gentiles in Sodom and Gomorrah. And you could write down destruction, judgment, punishment. The first example is this, destruction with Israel, verse 5. We know that both Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 And the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapters 3 through 4, you actually can find out a lot about apostasy in the book of Hebrews. In the letter of Hebrews, it's talked about more than any other letter of the New Testament. There's so much talk about those who turn away. There's so much, there's constant warning for God's people to stand strong in the truth. You'll find that all throughout Hebrews. So in Hebrews chapters 3 through 4, it's really highlighted, and and it uses, Paul uses this illustration of Israel in 1 Corinthians 10. The author of Hebrews uses the illustration of Israel in Hebrews 3 through 4. They use the experiences and the historical accounts of Israel to illustrate for us the importance of spiritual truths. And notice Jude sets this up. He first writes, Now I want you to remind, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it in verse 5. Now, what does that tell us from the start? Jude knew he wasn't telling you anything new. This is why you need to understand that the basics are necessary. And you don't lose sight of the basics. It's not like, okay, we learned this, now we move on and we forget about what we learned. No, you need to constantly be reminded of what you have learned. You need to constantly be reminded. You never go to a sermon and say, I've heard this passage preached before. You're already in danger, my friend, if that's the way you view the preaching of God's Word. Do you pick up your Bible and go to a passage and say, oh, I read this one before, let's go to a different one? You're in danger, my friend, if that's the way you view the Bible. There's a reason you guys have heard me say, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Because I'm always learning, amen? I'm constantly learning. And the moment that I stop learning, the moment that I think I'm so, I've arrived somehow, and I don't need to be refreshed, a refresher on these things, is the moment I'm heading down a dark, difficult path. And the apostates could lead me astray. They could lead you astray. So Jude says, I want want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, Jude knew he wasn't telling them anything new. They were already taught this example, but they needed to hear it again and again and again and to now apply it to their present day situation. Jude purposely uh, used, again, specific accounts that any real student of the word would quickly understand what those accounts were associated with and what went down in those instances. And if they didn't, it only demonstrated that they were lacking in their Bible study. And if it doesn't for us, that's just a lesson for you today, that if you don't know what these accounts are, maybe you're lacking in your Bible study. Amen? However, even though they are somewhat familiar, and they should be, I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says this, As for the root facts, the fundamental doctrines, the primary truths of Scripture, we must from day to day insist upon them. We must never say of them, everybody knows them, for alas, he says, everyone forgets them. Here's the principle. It is vitally necessary 
To learn from the past lest you repeat the problem in the present. Don't, we, we don't ever want to say, oh, our church will never be like that church. Our leadership would never do what that leadership did. Our members would never do what their members did. Oh, our, our, that, our marriage would never, uh, that would never happen to our marriage. That, that would never happen to our family. I would never drop the ball like that as a parent. Oh, yes, you would. Solomon was on uh, to something when he wrote and he said this in Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been, he says, is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Brothers and sisters, let me just say that uh, if you think our problems, even in our own nation today, are unique to the United States of America, think again. Our crumbling from within is what has happened to empires and nations that have long gone before us. And we're on the dangerous pattern of the same ways of these fallen empires and nations and kingdoms that have gone in the wrong direction. Empires and nations and kingdoms, they crumble from the inside out because of sin. That's the biggest problem in the United States of America. It is still sin. If sin is not appropriately addressed, if sin is not appropriately dealt with, if the word of God is not faithfully preached and disciples are not made, of course the nation will crumble from the inside out. It begins at the house of God. That is where judgment starts with us, brothers and sisters. Are we the real deal? If you're not the real deal, then you're a part of the problem. Amen? What did the nation of Israel do? Well, Jude reminds us that Jesus, he says in verse 5, I love this, I love that the ESV translates this, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Who did this? Jesus. Fascinating. Jude tells us who did uh, all this with his people. It was always Jesus. Jesus is not some new, uh, he didn't just come into being in Bethlehem. He always was. He is the Word in the beginning, as John makes clear, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus. The Word becomes flesh. John 1.14. It's always been Jesus. He's God who made everything. So He's the God who dealt with His people, even with wrath in the Old Testament. You see, that's why we don't look at the Old Testament and say, oh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, different God. (laughs) You don't understand who God is, my friend. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And the Bible, my Bible, Bible tells me that it is Jesus. It is the Lord. They are one and the same. Jesus is the Lord. The Lord is Jesus. And Jesus is the Yahweh who works with his people in the Old Testament. Remember when Jesus was questioned by the Jews at the temple in John 8. He said uh, there in John 8, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. John eight fifty eight. Jesus said that he was he was then the Bible tells us the Bible tells us what happens then uh, John 8 59 so they picked up stones these Jews did they picked up stones to throw at him why do they want to kill him on the spot because they know what I am refers to they know they're immediately as good Bible students of the Old Testament they're going he just called himself the I am before Abraham was I am that's only one I am in the Old Testament and it's Yahweh at the burning bush with Moses Amen that's right ba 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 bo <laughs> This is why you got to have kids with I love it it's, Amen Why why did they why did they do this Why did they want to kill him? Because Jesus clearly just said he is God. Bottom line. Exodus 3.14, just as a reference, it says this, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, uh, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Furthermore, there are at least seven I am statements that Jesus gives uh, in the, throughout the Gospel of John that John specifically references to. That's the whole point of John's thrust in his Gospel account as that non-synoptic Gospel. He wants to highlight Jesus primarily. Just look at his deity. Look at that which affirms his deity. You read through the Gospel of Christ, you know what you see? And this, this, you see Jesus is God. That was the whole purpose of the Gospel of John. John wasn't mixed up on that. 
John knew that Jesus was God, so he records these seven I am statements of Jesus. Where's my brother Jan? Jan, Jan asked me, uh, these Jehovah Witnesses had come to his, I, I shared this I think a while back about these Jehovah Witnesses coming to Jan's house, and Jan came to me and he said, could you write a response letter to Jehovah Witnesses? Could I? <laughs> I sure could. So we we wrote it up and we sent it out. I gave it to Jan. He sent it. He sent it out to him. And they there's this. And I wanted to. Can I read you just some of what I wrote in the letter? I, I wrote I wrote this to these Jehovah Witnesses. First of all, I made it clear from the start. My brother's a Christian. We love Jesus. Went through all that. And then I said, Did you know Jesus said, "I am the bread of life." John six thirty five. John six forty one. John six forty eight and fifty one. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the door of the sheep, John uh, 10, 7 and verse 9. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. 25. Death is not the final word for those who are in Christ. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11, John 10, 14. Jesus is committed to caring and watching over those who are his. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, John 14, 6. Jesus is the source of all truth and knowledge of God. John 15, 1 and John 15, 5, Jesus said, I am the true vine. So I wrote, in short, I'll just say that there are seven I am statements of Jesus recorded for us in the Gospel of John. And really, there are even nine of them when you include John 8, 56 through 58, which I just read. And John 18, 4 through 5, at Jesus' arrest, where we read, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And I noted that our modern English translations add a word here where they insert he. But the original Greek manuscript simply reads, I am. Then, interestingly enough, when Jesus said this, the band of soldiers drew back and fell to the ground, John 18, 6. And rightfully so, Jesus was not only unapologetically confessing to the reality that he was the man they were looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, but he was once more using the heavy burning bush title, I am. Words that certainly carry enough weight to knock anyone down. Amen? So now that we know that Jesus Christ is Lord, He is indeed Yahweh in the Old Testament, what did He do for His people? What does Jude remind us of? He reminds us that Jesus saved His people. He delivered them out of the land of Egypt, verse 5. After a 400-year slavery to the Egyptians, God rescued His people as He promised He would. By the way, He promised all of this would happen back in Genesis. Down to the T, that how long they would be in slavery, that he would raise up a deliverer, he would deliver them out of their slavery. He told them all that was going to happen uh, before it happened. He has a way of doing that because he's, he's God. He, and then eventually, what did he do? He raised up Moses right on time and raised up Aaron. He shamed the powerhouse empire of Egypt. He demonstrated his, his authority, his deity, his power over the idols and the false gods of this world. He dethroned Pharaoh. He dethroned Pharaoh and demonstrated to him to be nothing more than a weak, defenseless fool. I love that. When God brought his ten plagues upon Egypt, it was to demonstrate two important things, and the Bible tells us this. It was to make known to the Israelites that the God of their fathers was alive and worthy of their worship, and he alone was God. Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Exodus chapter 12, verses 25 through 27. But it was also to demonstrate this church. What he was about to do with Egypt in delivering his people was also to demonstrate that the Egyptians and their gods were nothing. Amen? God steps up to the plate to bat, okay? You all had a swing. Now let me swing, and I'm going to hit this thing out of the park, and you're going to see who the real powerhouse uh, authority is here. And I'm going to demonstrate my authority, my power, and he's going to shame all the little gods of Egypt. By the way, that's what he's going to do when he returns to the earth and he dashes the enemies into pieces. He's going to demonstrate who the real powerhouse is. He's going to demonstrate who the one who's always been in charge and really is in charge and will always be in charge is. 
Exodus 7, 5, Exodus 12, 12, Numbers 33, 4, God states this. This is why he did this, shaming the false gods of Egypt. So let's walk down through this. If you don't mind, let's do this. The first plague. Remember what the first plague was? It was, it was their precious Nile River. Let's start there. Your so-called life source that you have. America, we have our little life sources, don't we? People, places, and things, and finances, and resources. Isn't it interesting that many of these things are collapsing? Like sinking sand in our hands. We can't do anything with these things. It's just we, it, Yeah, you get paid, it's gone. You get paid, it's gone. It's like it's wings, it flies away. Where's it all going? Got holes in our pockets. Words of money just... Poof. Think of what, I think, is it a Hosea, or Hosea or Habakkuk that talks about that? The holes in their pockets, it just goes away. The first plague, if you remember, their precious Nile River, what did God do? He turned it to blood. He executed a clear judgment against, they had a god named Apis, the god of the Nile. There was Isis, the goddess of the Nile. There was Cahum, the guardian of the Nile. What's up, Cahum? Can't you protect your little Nile River here? You don't have anything under control. It's turned to blood. The Nile was also believed, it was, it was believed by the Egyptians to be the bloodstream of Osiris, who they say was reborn each year when the river flooded. The river was also the basis of their entire daily living, their national economy centered around the Nile River. It was devastated. There were millions of fish that flopped up dead. All dead. The Nile River, it's completely unusable. You got no, you got no river here. You got no Nile River. What are you going to do, Egyptians? Pharaoh was told, I love Exodus 7, 17. By this you shall know that I am the Lord. You're going to know, Pharaoh, what's up. Amen? I'm going to show you who's in charge. You're going to see who the Lord is. Second plague, it was the frogs, if you remember, from the Nile now it's bring the frogs out. A judgment against the head of God named Haquit, the frog-headed goddess of rebirth, of birth. Frogs were thought to be sacred by the Egyptians. They were never to be killed by the Egyptians because they were thought to be sacred. After invading all their homes, remember the frogs, they polluted their houses. They came into their houses. They came into their homes. Frogs everywhere. Gray would love it. Frogs all over the place. But then those frogs, they eventually died. And their stinking corpses were everywhere, all throughout Egypt, and all in their houses, dead frogs. Not only did he say, who's in charge of the frogs, and send them come leaping into your house, but then he has them die, and now you've got these stinking dead frogs all over the place. What are you going to do? Hey, quit, your frog-headed stupid goddess. Frogs, could, they were dead everywhere. It was a clear offense where there were piles of this grotesque dead frogs all over the place in their land. Exodus 8, 13 through 14. Let's move to the third one. The third plague, it was these gnats. A judgment against Set, the god of the desert that they worshipped. Unlike the previous plagues, remember the Egyptian, the magicians at this point, they're unable to mimic this one. Just like today, there's some things we have our fireworks and the enemy will try to reproduce things and try, you know, see this in churches. Well, they'll try to reproduce things and make it look fancy and then make it look like they got some power. Well, there were magicians there in Egypt. They're trying to mimic some of these things. Oh, we can do it too. We can do it too. Well, they couldn't do this one. They couldn't even touch it. They couldn't really touch the other ones either. There's just a little thing that made it appear like they could. But these Egyptian ma 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 magicians at this point, they're unable to mimic or duplicate this plague at all. And even the Egyptian magicians, they then tell Pharaoh, imagine this, they go to their boss, and I imagine they don't even want to look him in the eye. They bring in the magicians! Show me that you guys got this! And they come in like this. And this is what they say. They come before Pharaoh, and I don't imagine they even look up, and they say, this is the finger of God. <laughs> Amen? This is a God, this is, this is beyond us. Exodus 8, 19. I love when these, you know, I, I don't love when tragedy happens. Don't get me wrong. But isn't it interesting that when tragedy strikes, you see the 9-11 moments and the horrible, horrific things that take place. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, the people come out and they start to think, the finger of God is among us. We need to go fill God's house. We need, to, we need to turn to Scripture suddenly. Suddenly, they want to become Christians. 
Interestingly enough, Jesus would later say this, though, in Luke 8, 11, 20, and I, was, I just happened to come across this week, and I was reading Exodus 8, 19, where they said this is the finger of God. Later, Jesus would say, but if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons. Same language. Isn't that, I just love Jesus. Amen? Sometimes I wonder, if he, did he put that little nugget there for those reasons? For us to remember that he is the finger of God. He would later say, uh, if, if I by the finger of God, if I cast out demons, he says this, then the kingdom of God has come upon you, Luke eleven twenty. Then the fourth plague, there were flies everywhere. Flies, a judgment against you, you at it. The fly God, the, no, no swarms of flies, these uh, swarms of flies, they didn't bother, if you remember the Israelites where they lived. They only swarmed the Egyptians. Exodus 8, 21 through 24. Kind of like when the rest of the world falls apart under the weight of difficult circumstances and you see somehow the church perseveres through it. How does that happen? Let me, let me remind you that Christianity itself, if it wasn't true, it would have died out long, long, long ago. But here we are. There are more Christians today than ever. It, the, the, the church has expanded much more than it ever was in the beginning. It has continued to grow, and we have people all around the world coming to faith in Jesus and worshiping Jesus and dying for their faith today. So that's the fourth plague fly. And I see all these Egyptians over there going crazy, and they look over at the, uh, you know, they look over at the Israelites, and they're over there just like, these idiots look at them they look like a bunch of miserable people and then the fourth that, that was the fourth plague then the fifth plague there was the death of the livestock how is it already that time we're not going to get past these this part that's okay the fifth plague though was the death of the livestock it was a judgment of the goddess hathor the god ape uh the hathor uh, the god then there was the god apis also they both were depicted as cattle that they worshiped now remember, God said he's going to judge their gods. He's going to make it clear that he's the one and only God. And this is what he's doing. God protected his people again from this plague, but the Egyptians, they lost all their cattle. Pharaoh, at this point, he starts to send his little investigative reporters to go see what's going on with Israel. Are they also suffering? Exodus 9-7. Imagine those guys coming back like the magicians. Oh, geez. Why did we get this job? They're doing great, Pharaoh. They don't have any of these problems. It's just us. But here's Pharaoh getting pushed against a corner. That's the idea of his hardened heart, isn't it? That when you push a bully up against his, in, in, in a corner, he just gets angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier because he's a bully. And he doesn't, he doesn't ever change. Pharaoh doesn't change. His heart just is hardened by what God is doing. God continues to harden Pharaoh's heart because he's not done yet going to push you further into a corner. I'm not done with you, Pharaoh, and I'm going to harden you even more because I've got a purpose that I'm serving here. The sixth plague were boils, a judgment against several gods over health and disease. There was Sekhmet, there was uh, Sunu, there was also Isis again, Egypt, Egypt's magicians at this point. They couldn't even stand before Pharaoh. Now when he calls for his Egyptians, they can't even stand because they got boils all over them. They can't even stand up. They can't even come. They're, they're, you know, where's my guys, Egyptians? They're homesick. <laughs> they can't even come. Then before God sent the last three plagues, remember Pharaoh was given a special warning, a message from God at this point. These last three plagues would be even more severe than the other ones. They would serve the purpose to convince Pharaoh and all the people, Exodus 9, 14, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Pharaoh was even told that he was placed in his position by God at this point. That the only reason you're even in the position you're in, Pharaoh, is because I appointed you there. Remember that with the President of the United States, no matter who they are. That they're only there because God has permitted for them to be there, or else they would never even be there. They're not in charge. God, God could show his power and declare his name throughout all the earth, and he's about to, Exodus 9, 16. So we move quickly now. to the, Let's go to the seventh plague. There's hail attacking, not the sky goddess, Osiris again, who was also the crop of fertility uh, god. There was Set again, who was also the storm god. 
This hell, it was unlike anything they had ever seen before. It was accompanied by fire. It wasn't just hell, but fire came down. It ran down along the ground and everything was burnt to a crisp, devastated their fields, devastated their crops. Israel was miraculously again spared about that. They're all on fire over there. We're good to go over here. The eighth plague, these locusts, again, shaming not Osiris and Set, the, the, la- the latter crops, the wheat and the rye, which had survived the hell, they're completely devoured so that anything that even survived the last plague now is completely obliviated. All eaten up. They got no food. They got no water. He has shut down Egypt. There would be no harvest next that year. Period. How many people are going to starve to death now? What is God saying? I am the Lord. This is what you get with your false gods. This is when you get when you turn away from the truth. This is what you get with apostasy. Amen? They worship the creation rather than the creator as Paul talks about in Luke and Romans 1. Professing themselves to be wise, they were fools, brothers and sisters. Many are the same today. We move from the locust and we get to the, finally the ninth plague. Remember, complete darkness. Clearly uh, aimed at the sun god, Ra, who was symbolized by Pharaoh himself, who was believed to be incarnate of Ra. And, and then he couldn't do anything about it. The sun shut down. The land of Egypt goes dark. And I love that it says a darkness that could be felt. This was a supernatural darkness. It wasn't just like, okay, suddenly it got a little dark out wasn't just like some eclipse. No, this was an eerie, supernatural, heavy darkness that could be felt. It was a terrifying, unearthly darkness. And, but remember, the homes of the Israels had light. There's, there's little light shining in the midst of darkness. Their little Israelite homes, they got light over there. Here we are. Where, imagine how terrifying. Do you understand how terrifying that was for these Egyptians? And then lastly, the 10th plague, the last one, There was the death of all the firstborn males. This was a clear judgment on Isis, the protector of children. It was also a direct act of judgment against Pharaoh himself, who couldn't even stop the death of his own firstborn son, couldn't protect his boy, because he's not God. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be his name. This was a direct act against uh, uh, all their gods. It plagued, uh, remember, in, in this plague also, this last plague, this is where Passover is instituted. Passover, the homes, those who took an unblemished male lamb and killed it, they would smear the blood of the lamb on the top of, uh, and the sides of their doorways, blood here and blood here and blood here, and the blood would run down and it would perfectly illustrate a blood-stained cross, friends, on their cross, on their door. And because of that blood from the lamb that God told him to slay that was to be roasted in the fire and then eaten uh, that night and they were to eat it ready to go because God was about to deliver them and death would pass over their house that night. Death would have no hold or power over them because the blood of the lamb was applied to their homes. And who's the lamb? Jesus. Jesus did it. Isn't that what Jude tells us? It's all Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us Christ, he's our Passover lamb. He's been sacrificed. Now just think of all that that God did for his people in this situation. We're almost done. We're not going to go beyond verse 5, so don't worry. This this would go on to, the, the children of Israel would go on to experience not only all these incredible miracles from God. Miraculous deliverance would come at the Red Sea that even when the enemies of God's people would chase after them, they'd come to the Red Sea and God would part it for his people. And they would walk on that dry ground. It wasn't even wet for them, right? That would have been awful to get stuck in some deep clay and you'd be a mess. And the water, you know, how terrifying would that be? How difficult? No, dry ground. He even dried the ground for them. They walk across. And then when the enemy comes in, the waters swallow up the enemies and they are judged. Then they heard the voice of God, remember, at Mount Sinai. Nothing could even touch the mountain. If it touched the mountain, it would die because God was coming down. Amen? The Ten Commandments, the law, preparing them for the promised land, hearing from God, having the word delivered to them. 
God speaking clearly to them. God coming down and meeting with his people. They received his daily care, his provision, the manna in the wilderness, the waters that were bitter made sweet. Yet they lapsed and they rebelled. And they apostatized, didn't they? They turned to unbelief. This generation would never enter the promised land. This takes place, we know, in Numbers 14. Remember the spies they sent out into the land. The spies that went out into the land. And they bring back all this fruit. Oh, look at all this fruit. But there's giants. The sons of Anak were like grasshoppers in their sight. You got one guy. Here's the contender. Here's what Jude's after. What's his name? Caleb and Joshua. Caleb and Joshua. I love that you named both your. It's the coolest thing ever, Joe. I got to say. Caleb is such a. I love that. Caleb and Joshua. And these guys are ready to go. Like, what are you talking about? We got, God's got this. They understood all that God did. They took it to heart. Everybody else had the knowledge, but they didn't have it in here. And that's what apostates do, friends. They have the knowledge. They could quote you scripture. They could talk about the miracles. They can say, I've seen God do this, or I've seen God do this with his people, and I know God does, but they don't have it in here. They don't care about the Lord our God. They're not love Jesus. They don't treasure the word in their heart. They just know it externally. They just know it up here. And knowledge without application means nothing at the end of the day. Jude reminds us of what happens in Numbers 14. God delivered his people Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They went uh, out of Egypt without, without delay. They came to this Kadesh Barnea on the threshold of the promised land. But Karnesh Barnea, uh, the people refused there to trust God to enter the promised land of Canaan now. And therefore, almost none of that adult generation, again, except for Caleb and Joshua, would enter the promised land. It would be the next generation. So 40 years, you're going to be suffering in this wilderness now. And you're going to die in this. You're going to perish in this wilderness. You will not enter into my rest. You know, and what does the rest symbolize? The rest symbolizes, according to what we read in Hebrews, what we share in in Jesus. Amen? He's our Sabbath rest. And those who do not know the Lord our God, brothers and sisters, they do not know the rest of they, they do not know the rest of Jesus. They are not in relationship with Jesus. They do not ever even enter into that rest. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. They are false apostates, false disciples and apostates. And you know what Moses had to deal with? He had to deal with these idiots the rest of his life. Always complaining, always murmuring, always oh, that's what apostates are good for, too. They infiltrate the church. And what do they do? Murmur and complain. Oh, pastors shouldn't do this. Oh, they shouldn't teach this. Oh, I think I didn't get... They cause problems. God will deal with them. Numbers 13, 26 or 29. We came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And beside, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and all the Jordan. And after Caleb sought to calm them all down, they said, well, we seem to ourselves to be as grasshoppers. Numbers 13, 33. And then when God tells them that they're not going to enter into the rest, if you remember, uh, what, what, what happens is there's a, there's a group of them that say, well, okay, we're sorry. We're sorry. Let's go. Now we'll fight. We don't want to be in this wilderness. That's what, it, that's what apostates do. They're, they're, it's only an agenda for themselves. We don't want to be out in this wilderness. We want the milk and honey. We want the fruit. We didn't know you were going to do this. Well, God told them he was going to do this. They needed to trust him. They didn't want to believe God. They didn't want to trust him. And now that they see there's gain for them, that we're going to have to be in this wilderness till we die, well, now we'll go fight. And what does Moses warn them? You're, you're not going to win. And what did they do? They went up anyways. That's what apostates do. It's all about self. And they lost miserably to the enemy. People perished. People died. Israel, that entire generation was destroyed, perishing in the wilderness. Psalm 95 is all about that. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation, God says, and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. Let's stand, bow our heads, close our eyes. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, we're going to leave off here with Israel. It's the first example that Jude gives us of apostasy in the Old Testament. 
They turned away and they were destroyed in that wilderness. They never entered into God's rest. And who dealt with them? Jesus did. Here's my encouragement with you. Check your heart this morning. Where are you really at with Jesus? Are you truly a believer or aren't you? Take that as serious as serious can be. Do I love Jesus? Have I repented of my sin and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and truly genuinely believed on him as my only means of salvation and forgiveness of sin? And am I following him as my Lord? Am I turning away from sin? One of the evidences, the great evidence of a true convert, that the Holy Spirit is inside of you, that you do not return to sin, you constantly turn from sin. You're turning away from it. You're not regularly embracing it. There must be a clear and present transformation that has happened in you, my friend. Has that happened? Are you converted or are you not? If you're not, today can be the day of salvation for you. Turn from your sin. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and look unto him who laid down his life for you at the cross and believe on him as your only means of forgiveness of sin. You've transgressed the laws of God and you deserve hell. But Jesus paid your sin debt with his blood. And he'll save you right now if you would truly turn from sin, repent and believe on him, surrender your life to him and follow him as Lord and God. And he'll save you. Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. These Israelites, their sin was the sin of unbelief. Do you believe? Are you believing on Jesus now? Who do you not know that is not believing? Do, do you understand the, the road that they're on? Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Many are on that broad, broad road of destruction. Would you pray for them with me now? Oh Lord, would you deliver them from that road? Who could, whose door could you knock on? What neighbor could you see? What coworker could you go to? And point them to the way of salvation, the narrow way of Christ. For he is the only way, the truth, and the life. Get off the broad road that Israel was on, the way of destruction. And look unto Jesus. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Respond to the Lord however you need to this morning before we sing our last song. Talk to the Lord. Let him deal with your heart. If you need someone to pray with you, just come forward and say, Pastor, could somebody pray with me? And we'll get someone to pray with you. If you have questions on how to become a Christian, please come see me. I would love to talk to you about how you could know Christ as your Savior, how you could become a Christian, be saved today. If you're watching the live stream, reach out to us, call us, contact us. We'd love to tell you how you could become a Christian, a Christ follower, be saved, be delivered from your sin, and come from the broad way that leads to destruction to the narrow way of Christ, the only way, truth, and life for you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. you I thank you for first loving us Lord Lord protect us Lord from false teachers protect us from the wolves in sheep's clothing the snakes Lord that slip into the pond Lord help us to beware help us Lord to see evil to expose it when we see it to deal with it the right way 
to stand on the truth, to boldly proclaim Christ, and to contend for the faith. And Lord, help us to guard our own hearts from any spirit of unbelief. And Lord, help us to press on and persevere with our eyes set ablaze upon you, Jesus. Help us not to look back or to the left or to the right, Lord. Help us to fixate our eyes upon you. We know that no man looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord, help us to keep our hand on the plow and plow forward and follow you with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength, all our soul, all our might, Lord. Help us to give it our all, Lord. You are worthy of our all in all for you are all in all, Lord Jesus. We love you. We thank you that you are God and you shame the false gods that are your enemies in this world, those gods that are nothing. And Lord, you show us that you are truly almighty, powerful God, Lord, and everything is beneath you. We thank you. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. Lord, as we sing this last song, remind our hearts afresh, Lord, of, of the glory of the gospel, how you died on that cross, you were buried, and you rose again, Lord. Help us to stand under that shadow of Mount Calvary at that cross again and wonder at the magnificent glory of what it means to be in Christ, to be saved by you, and the finished work of how you shamed your enemies and disarmed the enemies, Lord, at the cross the way that you did for us. We love you, Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen.